Hello. You can hear? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, how's the sound? It was quite loud, actually. Is it too loud? It's okay. It's okay? Alright. The reverb is okay? So, welcome. It's also your first time here? Yes. Alright. So, um, I've, I've done already, Shanti. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome to Chogosam Lane. That's the name of this place. It's a Tibetan Buddhist uh, meditation and study center. So, um, most of the time, running throughout the year and the main thing that we do actually is um, we give classes more on the uh, Buddhist philosophy and so um, there's always a, a question well how then do we put it into practice because some of the texts that we're going through um, the one that we're doing tomorrow and on Sunday we've been going over for, what, more than a year now? Two years, maybe? One, yeah, a little more than a year, and we're about halfway through the text. So then, especially newcomers, it's like, okay, we'll go through a few stanzas of this text, but getting the overall a picture, and especially the question about, like, how then do I start to practice in my daily life, then, um, uh, we get that question a lot. And that was the kind of impetus behind this uh, night session, tonight's session. Um, so a lot of the people who are asking for it, they don't even come <laughs> when we do it. But uh, that's life. Okay? Um, so what I was going to do. Um, there is, I think on your table, there's two little handouts, which you can keep. Um, so the, the main one here is, um, I know I have a pink one, I'm sorry, the white one, let's, let's just be equal, okay? Um, the method to transform the suffering life into happiness. So these are different verses and, and practices for contemplation that our spiritual director, Professor Bernard Shea, compiled. And he very much um, wants all of his students around the world to do this uh, on a daily basis. So uh, I'm going to go through these, uh, this booklet and uh, kind of tell you, um, you know, how to think about what to think as you're going through these verses, you know. Um, but first, I mean, to be very practical, what one would do is um, you want to start your day with some practice, right? Um, and there's a few reasons for that, but the, the most important, and <clears throat> I guess the impetus, impetus behind the, the, the title, The Method to Transform, a suffering life and the happiness, you see. Um, there's a big emphasis on setting on motivation for the day. You know, because it is our motivation uh, that primarily determines whether our actions become virtue or non-virtue. Virtue being the cause 
for happiness and uh, non-virtue being the cause for suffering. So, the method to transform a suffering life into happiness just means the method what, whereby we can transform our motivation for living, our, mo our, our motivation when we get up in the morning from you know, a non-virtuous type of motivation, motivation which is mainly concerned about you know, chasing after the pleasures of this life, to expanding our motivation to become something um, more virtuous, you know, and particularly um, transforming that to be not just oriented about our, our, ourselves and our own happiness, but rather being focused on others and others' happiness. Okay? Um, hmm? So that's that. Then the other thing why this is important um, in the morning is, well, usually uh, that morning time right when we wake up is some time we have for ourselves, you know, before our life gets going, before, um, you know, the pressures of, of work life come up. Um, right when we wake up, we can, uh, you know, set the agenda ourselves. So actually, um, many of the so-called productivity gurus, not Buddhist gurus, productivity gurus in Silicon Valley and so forth, they very much recommend having these like morning rituals. Um, many of them, you know, they wake up at four in the morning and uh, have some personal time, you know, for themselves and go through a kind of morning ritual. Yeah. Um, ritual doesn't mean letting incense and, uh, you know, uh, you know, ringing, ringing some singing bell. But it just means a um, kind of list of tasks that they go through, kind of uh, habitually, um, kind of once we develop a habit to do it, then it's just a kind of, uh, that's what I mean by ritual. It's kind of an autopilot. We don't have to think about, well, what should I do in the morning? So, we wake up in the morning, okay, and what do we do? Well, let's first start off with what we don't do, and that is to check our phone and, uh, you know, see what kind of messages came in the night, or look at the news and all that, you know? So, um, some people even recommend having the phone uh, in another room or locked away in a door, or turned off, or sorry, locked away in a drawer, or turned off over the night, you know. Um, so that's very good, very good to do. And so, um, also, if you can, um, do you guys set an alarm, or are you waking up naturally? No. Alarm? Two hours before actually I want to wake up. I am, no, no, no. So, yeah, now I'm, I'm trying to work on this, you know, but I'm actually, like many people in this day and age, um, I'm very sleep deprived. But um, even when I try to sleep in and I tell my body, um, sleep as long as you want, I'm often up like, you know, earlier, maybe two hours earlier than I want to wake up. Naturally. But if you can, you know, um, the sunlight wakes me up, it seems. You know? So like, I'm already at six, I'm up. You know? Some of that is some conditioning. But if you can, you see, because when you have an alarm, we have different uh, phases in our sleep cycle, right? There's light sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, all this stuff. And if you cut off your sleep, in the middle of a REM cycle, I think, okay? then you're very groggy, you know, and in a bad mood. Do I act like I've been cut off in my REM <laughs> So normally, you know, it's, it, it is actually quite, quite nice. There's actually some apps that I've been looking at. Um, sleep score is one of them. I don't know. I'm not advertising, I'm not sponsored by that. You can check it out.
but um, it's a little bit um, inconvenient where I live because you need to put it on your nightstand, and I don't have a nightstand. But you put it like this, you put your phone. There's one exception to the no phone rule. But you have it, and it, um, it re records the sound, and based on that, it can tell somehow which phase of sleep you're in. Right? And then if you have a like, window when you want to get up, say between 7 and 7.30, or let's say 7 and 8, it, will, it can tell when you're not in REM. And then it'll play a very gentle alarm that will wake you up to make sure that you're not uh, interrupting your, your REM sleep. Okay? Just something to make you mind. Okay? Alright. So then when you sleep. Yes. These are our arms and stop alarm. Yes. Arm alarm. Yes. 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 Which is why it's best if you can wake up naturally without an alarm. Yeah. Um, but anyway, if you have to, there's this one app, or there's actually probably a few uh, on the market you can check that will then um, are able to monitor where you are in your sleep cycle and then uh, put that alarm at least that it doesn't jolt you out of uh, your REM sleep. Okay? Right. Is that the battery? Is it? Yeah. This, this battery is like, what's the deal? They don't even last. Mm. You know what it is? It's Amazon Basics. Like a weekend, right? Hello? This is a 3-4 lecture, 3-4 uh, weekend. 3 four, 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 four weekends? No, 2-3 uh, two, weekends. Oh. They seem like they're always going off on the I'm talking. Okay. Alright. So then, we're not hitting snooze. Okay? But we, we can get up, right? And then, um, I like to uh, start the day. Um, of course, as a, as a monk, there's certain um, uh, prayers that you say to Buddha. But um, if you're just beginners here, right? Then it's good to start with a uh, just basic breathing meditation. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we also, by the way, usually start this class with it. So I was giving just some background, but now we'll actually do what we can do in the morning. Okay, <clears throat> so I don't know if you already have a um, daily meditation practice set up. Do you? No. Okay. Um, so one thing that's good. Yeah, a basic, it depends, if you're very groggy, yeah, when you wake up, right, then something that can be good is just a, a little bit, um, kind of like a pranayama type uh, meditation, or like breathing, to expel the air that's uh, kind of got stuck overnight, you know, um, and get new air fresh in your lungs, okay? So, I'm not a pranayama teacher, but um, one, one way to do what my teachers have told me, yeah, is you emphasize the exhalation, right? You emphasize the exhalation more than the inhalation, right? So, um, one, one way of doing it, right, we can count our breaths, right? Okay. 
Um, so this, uh, I, I always appreciate um, your contributions. However, we have one day uh, on this topic. So um, let me try to go through everything. We only have two hours and I only have one hour and 35 minutes. So let me try to finish. I have a problem finishing um, lectures in the allotted time. So let me, let me try to finish this material. Then if we have time at the end, I'll um, welcome your, your insight. Okay? All right. So um, one thing we can do, right? Um, normally, when we do just breathing meditation, mindfulness of the breath, we're not counting. We're not trying to um, have a breath last a certain number of counts, hold a number of counts, and so forth. We're just working with the natural breath as it is. But in pranayama type meditation, we are trying to contrive and control our breath. Okay? So one very basic way, right? We um, inhale for four counts, hold it for seven, and exhale for eight. Okay? Just yeah, easy enough, right? So let's let's just try to do that. Um, okay? So you've you're you're just out of bed. Okay? You're out of bed. And just sit on a, a comfortable, like you know, comfortable meditation posture. You don't need to worry so much about getting into a lotus posture or anything. But just try to keep a straight back, okay? And then let's just try for you know five cycles of this, yeah. So. After five cycles, okay, then we'll go to our, the normal. Uh, yes. It's in inhalation. Yeah. Hold it for like five seconds. Yeah. Uh, I, I was saying, yeah, in, inhale for four. So hold it for seven and then exhale for eight. And then also you hold? No. No. Then you breathe. Then you breathe. So again, I'm not a pranayama teacher. Your other, uh, you know, yogis, pranayama teachers might teach you something else. And if you're already accustomed to something, great. This is one, um, you know, style that I learned. So, you know, but it, it's just an example, okay? And, you know, there's also nose breathing, there's all this stuff, there's the, you know, all this stuff, I don't even know what it's called. So, just, you can substitute what you like, okay? But the point is, do something where you're emphasizing exhaling, yeah? Okay, so after you then, yes. But it has to be open or closed? Because I, I read in Pema Chetran's book, in Mahaprabhu, yeah. she suggested to open your eyes. Yeah. But many books, they suggest that close the eyes. Yes. So what is the right method? 
Okay, so, um, yes. Yes, different meditation teachers say different things. In general, it's better to keep your eyes slightly open. Okay, now, what, what that means is just enough that light can come in. Not open like, you know, you're watching, I don't know, a movie or something, right? right? So just enough that a little bit of light can come in. Now, in general, it is easier to get concentrated when your eyes are closed, but it's also easier to fall asleep, you know? So you want to have it, you know, a little bit of light coming in, but I don't know, can you tell my eyes are open? Right? So, if you look at some depictions of Buddha, it's, it's like a kind of half open eye. You know? And then, you just be gazing down in the space in front of you. Right? Like, look past your nose. And just not fix your eyes on anything. But it's more just keeping the light in. Alright, so now, after we've done the, the, the first initial breaths, then we're going to move on to the so-called mindfulness of the breath meditation, right? Here, we're no longer trying to count whole breaths, right? But just then, going to a natural rhythm of breathing, okay? So we have the, you know, five or ten, whatever, however many you need of the kind of forced breathing style. Now, just let that go, okay? And then continue with just inhaling and exhaling, okay? Naturally, okay? Let the breath breathe, okay? And here, um, although we're saying we're focusing on the breath, where we're doing that, okay? So for, for beginners, what you can maybe do you notice, as we breathe in, the abdomen expands. As we exhale, it contracts. Okay? So let, let's, let's try to continue. Yeah? We'll, we'll learn by doing. Okay? So now just rest into that natural breath as it is. aware of the rising and falling of the abdomen. So here we don't have a preference for a long breath or a short breath. We're just trying to become aware of the breath as it is in this moment. but we're breathing uh, through the nostrils so keep your mouth closed just try to keep your mind aware <clears throat> of the rising and falling of the abdomen find sense of attention such that you become aware of the very split second when the inhalation becomes the exhalation and the exhalation becomes the inhalation and so forth.
So we can also, at the end of each exhalation, just mentally note, mentally count. So inhale, exhale, count one. Inhale, exhale, count two, and so forth. to meditate on the breath and if other appearances occur in the mind, be they external, like sounds, or internal, like different thoughts bubbling up, then you can become aware, but don't chase after those thoughts. Don't comment on the sounds. But rather just like drawings on the surface of a pool, drawings on the surface of the water, as soon as the drawing is made, it dissolves back into the water. So like that, these external or internal Appearances of the mind also dissolve back into the nature of the mind. If your mind gets so distracted that you have lost your count, then start over again at one. Practically speaking, uh, that segment of your morning, it can be as long or as short 
on my instrument as well. But um, uh, probably good to do at least 21 uh, rounds of breath. Yeah. Um, if you can do 31, that's good. And um, I like to say that, especially because we're, we're trying to build a new habit, um, we want to start small, start slowly, and then gradually build up. So uh, 21 breaths might take you, you know, three, four minutes. And then, you know, week on week, you can gradually add to that. Um, there's other um, teachers that want their beginning students to do an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. But, um, yeah. It's much more important that uh, you are meditating a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, than uh, trying to just uh, go out with a big, you know, a lot of energy at the beginning, but then that energy fizzles out. Yeah. So I, I like to suggest people starting slow and gradually build. So then next, next you bring this book out, okay? And so, um, let's, um, I'll just go over this book as it is. Um, I'll explain kind of part by part, word by word, and then, um, yeah, we can see how much time we have like that, okay? Alright, so um, let's start on page, well, it's unnumbered, but the first page, um, after all the notes, I think it's on like page 7, okay? So, the method to transform a suffering life into happiness, including enlightenment. Okay, so uh, since a few of you can relate, how did you come later than your sister? Did you travel together? I was on a call. You were on a call? I didn't come. Oh, did you get the job? <laughs> your sisters, they're staying with each other. The, sister, the younger sister comes in like <laughs> 10 minutes before the other one. Do you need a reference? Okay, at least you wouldn't want my reference. She comes late to my lecture. <clears throat> okay, but anyway, as I was saying at the beginning, right? So these, do you do this every day? Okay. Lama Zofar Rinpoche, your guru, compile all these verses and practices, put it into one very nice book booklet for us to transform our suffering life. Do we all have that? Yes. It's a happiness. Why? Because with these verses, we're going to be transforming our motivation from our usual motivation, just thinking about the happiness of this life, into, well, hopefully, uh, the mind of bodhicitta that wants to be a benefit to all sinning beings, vast as vast of space. Okay, so um, this is, these are Rinpoche's words. At the beginning of each day after you open your eyes until enlightenment is achieved and until death, and especially today, so that all the activities of your body, speech, and mind, hearing, thinking, and meditating, as well as walking, sitting, and sleeping, doing your job, and so on, do not become causes of suffering and instead become causes of happiness, and especially if they become the causes to achieve Buddhahood, that is, they transform them into a method for accomplishing benefit and happiness for all sitting beings. Here is a method for transforming the mind into holy dharma and especially into bodhicitta. Okay? So I had said this a little bit at the beginning, but you know, what determines whether our actions become virtue, non-virtue, positive or negative is the motivation with which we undertake them. Okay? So this is very important. 
You see, because it says here, right, even things like walking, sitting, sleeping, doing your job, right, which we normally think are worldly activities, right, they uh, actually can become virtue, and not only virtue, but actual method to attaining the state of enlightenment. How? If we do it with a mind, um, so here we have bodhicitta, right? Here is a method for transforming the mind into holy dharma and especially into bodhicitta. Okay? So, um, bodhicitta, yeah? Or bodhi is enlightenment. Chitta is more like chitta, right? Yeah? Huh? No? Chitta. Then uh, the mind of enlightenment, right? And in particular, it's a mind that aspires to achieve enlightenment, Buddhahood, for the benefit of all sinning beings. Okay? Um, uh, probably worth saying a little bit about this <laughs> now, right? But um, you see, the Buddha who we revere, you know, uh, wasn't always Buddha, but rather was just like us, and then through a method of transforming the mind, then became Buddha, right? And then those methods, those techniques, he then taught and were passed down through the centuries by other uh, great masters, and uh, now they exist to this day. Okay. Um, I say it almost every, yeah, I think I say it every weekend I come. So why not keep the street going? But there's a verse by Nagarjuna, the Indian master, where he pays homage to Buddha. and. Um, this is actually the first thing that His Holiness the Dalai Lama recites every morning when he wakes up. It's a verse of homage to Buddha, where he says, you know, Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views. To Gautam Buddha, I pay homage, I prostrate. Okay. So within this one uh, stanza, actually, you see, it says, Transforming the mind into Holy Dharma. It actually encapsulates the entire Holy Dharma. Yeah. So it shows in the first line the motivation of Buddha. What motivated him? Right? Enthused or motivated by great compassion. Right? So compassion is a thought that wishes others to be free from suffering. Okay? Um, and so that is what is motivating every single one of the Buddha's actions. Actually, it's what motivated him at the beginning of his path, you know, to enlightenment. Yeah. Because although you might have compassion that wishes others to be free from suffering, if you look at your current situation, you know, if we ourselves are not free of suffering, how can we free others from suffering? So, um, we also see this in the world. The more skills, the more qualities, you know, the more knowledge you have, the more you're able to benefit others, right? Um, I mean, you'll see in, within the, the text there's a lot of medical analogies, right? And so, although you might, you know, see someone who has a cataracts. This is a very widespread in the higher elevations in Tibet, right? Someone might have a cataract, you know? Cataract causes blindness, right? You might have compassion. Oh, I, I, I want them to be able to see. But you don't just go take a scalpel to their eye, right? Unless you have the training, right? Mm. So, yes, that compassion, the motivation that they be free from the suffering is good, 
but we also need the, the, the skills, the tools, the ability to do it, right? And so actually, if we, you know, if we boil down our entire practice, it consists of just two things, actually. Benefiting others and increasing our ability to benefit others. That's it. Okay? Mm. So, uh, how then do we benefit others, right? If we want to be, uh, you know, help beings be free from suffering, right? Then, we say we're following the footsteps of Buddha, then what did the Buddha do? Well, then he inquired, it's a good question, I want sending beings to be free from suffering. Why do they suffer? What causes suffering? And so, um, the other um, stanza that I say almost every weekend is that the Buddhas do not uh, wash away our negativities with water, nor do they remove our sufferings with their hands, nor do they transfer their realization to another mind stream. But the Buddhas liberate sentient beings by teaching the reality, you know, the truth of reality. Okay? So although the Buddha is motivated by compassion, wants all sending beings to be free from suffering, right? Can't just snap his fingers and make it happen. But rather inquiring and seeing that, okay, so now we're back to the Nagarjuna stanza, right? You taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views, right? To Gautam Buddha Prashra. So the Buddha's discovery was that the source of all of our suffering is based on flawed ways of thinking, you know, incorrect, distorted views of reality, and particularly mm, distorted views about how ourselves and other phenomena exist. Okay, so we have, if you notice, please notice this, please investigate this, you know, uh, we have a quite inflated larger than life sense of ourself, okay? And uh, you can think about it when, you know, someone, I don't know, accuses you or insults you, there's this like, me, you said that to me, you know, right? And it's, um, this really big sense of I, right? You insulted me, you know? And then, when we're hurt like that, then what happens? We want to retaliate. On the other hand, uh, when we have like a lot of craving, desire, you know, attachment, uh, there's also a, a sense of, of, of I that comes up, and I want this, you know? something that we want to then possess and cling on to, we also have a very big sense of I. This happened to you? Yeah. We'll get into this a little bit later. But, you know, Nagarjuna in his verse, right? You taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views. Okay. The root, actually, of all of samsara, this is what the Buddha discovered, uh, is this distorted view about how we exist. Okay. And um, our, our main job, which we'll get into later, is going to be investigating how we conceive of ourselves, you know, and then see if that conception is in accordance with reality or not. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to finish today. Okay, but this is important. So I'm going to give... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give one little hint, some 
kind of thought experiment for you. And this is one that uh, I've given a few times, but I don't do it every weekend, Sadhana. Okay? Not every weekend. Okay? So, um, just to give some, some homework for you. Okay? The Buddha's discovery, or the Buddha's, well, we can, let, let's not even call it a discovery. Let's, let's still treat it as a hypothesis for us. Because even though the Buddha might have said something, we still have to check and use our analysis to see if it's true. Okay? We, we're not about blind faith here. Okay? But um, the Buddha's hypothesis was that all of our suffering is fundamentally rooted in a distorted sense about how we exist. Okay? Now, it's important that I said how we exist. It's not whether we exist or not. Okay? You all exist. The things that we normally conceive in the world, you know, like cups and clocks and uh, rickshaws, phones, phones that are switched in silent mode during lectures, right? All these things exist. Okay? But how they exist, that's a bit of a that's where we get into trouble, okay? So I'm going to give you just a little bit, something to, to chew on, okay? And uh, this is a thought experiment that was given by the great Indian master, uh, Dharmakirti, in the Pramanavartika. And so he invites us to, to just think, okay? If someone came up to you and said, uh, uh, um, you, can I have a volunteer? Volunteer? Yeah? Okay, what's your name? Jyoti. Jyoti. Okay. They said, Jyoti, I have a deal for you. Okay, let's say some, some god came up to you and said, Jyoti, I have a deal for you. Okay? We can trade your body, okay, switch it out, and give you a brand new body, okay? Yeah? Same age. Same age, even younger. <laughs> even younger. No, you, you can pick. Pick. You can upgrade, just like we do with our phones, okay? So I don't know who you like, you know? You can, a nice, you know, new body. Who, who would you pick? New body. Well, you you keep this, or you, would you? Up, uh, I don't want to say upgrade. Switch it to another. Come on, Katrina Cave. Or, you know, who, who do you like? Okay, I'd rather have a better mind. Okay, well that's the next deal. Yeah. That's the next deal. Huh? Better body. I'll prefer some height. Height. Okay. 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 Great. We'll give you a nice, taller, but basically same same features. You know, you like the black hair. Yeah, okay. Only a little bit on it, okay. We can do that. We'll give you a Jyoti plus, what, five centimeters? Ten centimeters? So I'm between five three and five four, and prefer five eight. Five eight, okay. Five eight is Okay, okay. We got that, we got that for you in our showroom. No problem. We'll, we'll switch out that, we'll give you that new body. And then, yeah, the more important, you're right. My nice have a better mind, okay? So, here in, the, in the, the Buddhist world, we have complete enlightened Buddhas, complete enlightened minds you can choose from, okay? So any of them actually have the same level of, of realization. They know all phenomena, right? And not only that, they're imbued with, you know, infinite love, infinite compassion, you know, perfect patience. They never get angry anymore. You know? They're never tired when they get up in the morning. You know? Okay? So we can switch you and we can give you... Why don't we give you the, the Buddha of Wisdom, Manjushri? We can give you the Manjushri's mind and basically your body, but 5'8". Yeah? Deal? Nice. Okay? All right. There's a game show in the U.S. called Let's Make a Deal. Do you have that here? 
and I, that you've maybe seen in other movies, right? Let's make a deal. Yeah, we had it, an Indian version. Indian version, yeah. Along that, it's, it was called Deal or No Deal. Okay, okay, yeah. It's a reality show. Oh. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it was in India. Okay. Long time. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's over now. All right. Now, the rest of you, you should also be thinking in the same way. Yeah? trade. I'm gonna make that trade. Me, I'd have a couple kilos off of this one. I, I'm okay with my height. Give me. You can work on that. You can't increase your height. Mm. I have been. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh too much. Okay. And of course the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Trade that one out. In a second. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Dhammakirti is saying, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. The fact that this thought experiment even makes sense to us, you know, what does it show? Right? That we have this sense of namjong, okay, that is like the somehow possessing a body and mind, you know? Just like, uh, Oh, where's my mala? You know, like I'm possessing, uh, you know? Okay. Oh, oh, okay, great. See, Manjushi wouldn't forget where his mala is, you know? Just like, I have my mala, I have my teacup, you know? And then I see, oh, what, oh what's that mala you got there? Ooh, this, is that real turquoise? You want to trade? You know? Or, ah oh man, I, this is a nice mug and all, but uh, I keep dropping things. I want one of those, you know, vacuum steel, you know, flask type things that I can drop. You want to trade? You know? So just like that, we have a possessor that owns and then can, you know, trade at will, right? We can trade, but the possessor is, is independent of the possessions, right? That, that's what I was saying, right? If I, had, if I was so forgetful, I just left it here, and I, and I went back to, to the hotel, I call up Sadhana, hey, is my male still at the center? You know, you can identify, oh yes, this is Namjong's male, right? And Namjong doesn't have to be there. Mm. So the, the possessor, independent of the possessions. Yes? Okay. Now, this I, the Namjong, as the possessor of Namjong's body and Namjong's mind, hmm? Yes? Do we have that? We have that. Our grammar suggests it. We talk about my body, my mind. We talk about my, my mala, my cup, right? Then the grammar suggests, yes, there's an I, the possessor of the body and mind. The, just like the possessor of the mama and the cup. That is separate, independent. Okay? But where is that? Where is the Namjong that is the owner of Namjong's body and Namjong's mind? Huh? Nowhere. No, no, no. So this, she just came from some teachings of Dai Lama on the Heart Sutra, where it talks about uh, you know, form is empty, emptiness is form, all this stuff. So she's she's rattling off all of the the right words to me, but we have to investigate this actually. Okay. So actually, when we say soul, right, the Atman, right, so the, the Buddhist teachings, the, the actual core principle is Anatman, no self. And 
is this thought of the self. Mm. And by the way, self distinguished from you, right? You, okay. But the Buddhist hypothesis, this kind of independent I, you know, that's somehow owning, controlling, you know, the body and mind, that one doesn't exist, but that's the one that rises up when we get, uh, you know, accused, when we get insulted. Okay, so, let's go on. So bodhicitta, right? The mind wishing to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, and then was going through the language in verse. You taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views, to go down Buddha posture. So to overcome all wrong views, because those wrong views about the self is the root of all of our suffering. And so I gave you a little bit of a, of a taste to have you start to think about. Hmm, how do I then exist? Yeah. Okay. But, you see, mm, the Buddha then taught the methods, right, to overcome these wrong views, seeing that they are worthy, uh, root of all of our suffering. Okay? So then, the wish to achieve that state of enlightenment, so you can be of utmost benefit to all sinning means, is the mind of bodhicitta. Okay? Alright. Excuse me. Can you please elaborate this anatma? Because the, my, my mind is in existence. Yes. I, I, I can feel my ego. Yes. How okay, can you please anatma? Non existence of. I mean, atma is equal to the mind, right? So, no. Uh, see, in, in the Buddhist concept, it's not. Uh, it's not equivalent. The mind and, and the, the atma. Right? And so just on a very basic level, right? If we're saying this one that would trade the mind, right? If we conceive of the mind and the self being the same, right? If, if, if that was our innate kind of conception, that the mind equals the I, then someone says we would trade your mind for Manjushri's mind, and we'd say, wait, that's impossible because I am just my mind, so there's no way to trade that. If you just implanted Manjushri's mind in this body, that'll no longer be me. You know? But the fact that that thought experiment even is making sense shows that there's a difference between that, the self and the and I. You know? The fact that we can then we can conceive it and don't reject it flat out. You know, um, like, like for example, uh, uh, does that make sense? I can make an example, but I'm not sure it's going to help or not. But let me try. Like, you have a drink in there, right? Is it is it full? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I have a drink in here, yeah? Um, no, that's not, that's not a good example. Sunlight. Sunlight? I no. Uh, well. Just. Like in. Did somebody die and it moves yeah. out? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Um, l l l let's go back. Like yeah, no, I know. Someone will be sleeping at the same time on the other part of the earth. Huh? So they are not seeing it, we are seeing it. That way, God. Ale, ale. No, no, no. Let, let's, um. Yeah. 
Let, let, let's, let's continue. Let's continue. Okay. So now, uh, direct meditation on the gra graduated path containing all the important meanings. Okay. So now, the Buddha taught the Holy Dharma to overcome all wrong views. Okay. So then, all of these uh, Dharma teachings, right, that the Buddha taught, they form uh, 108 volumes. We have them here. But who has time to read 108 volumes? Hmm? Who has interest to read 108 volumes? Maybe it's a better question. So, Graduated Path, um, or Lamrim, is a... It's actually a genre of text, of, of commentary, on the sutras that arrange the topics that are found in the sutras into order of practice. Okay? So this one, you see in the next, whatever, two, two pages, encapsulates the entire Buddha Dharma, okay? But, and, and it contains all the important meanings, you know? And uh, I think it's true, okay? So what, we'll, what we now do, okay? We've done our breathing meditation. We now are going to go through, this is called a scanning meditation. We're, you know, just like if we scan across the room, we can see everything that's in here, right? We're going to scan the entire path to enlightenment in just, you know, stanza by stanza. So it's not about reading the words out loud or chanting it beautifully, but each stanza, each word, we reflect on the meaning and we try to enact a kind of mental transformation. Okay? All right. So, essence encompassing all the Buddhas, originator of all the Holy Dharma, scripture and realization, principle of all the Aryas and Tenet virtue, in the glorious Holy Gurus I take refuge. Okay. So, this, um, if you're brand new, even the Dalai Lama, he says, well, before you take someone on as a guru, you should check him or her out. Don't just jump into things, okay? But rather, you know, you attend lectures, like you would attend a university lecture, right? You're gaining some knowledge, it's all good, but you're not saying, oh, glorious, you know, sir. Right? Okay. Later, you know, after you do the checking, then the more you can conceive of your spiritual master as being an enlightened being, then I'll tell you, the more likely it is that you'll follow their instructions. And the more you follow their instructions, if they're a qualified guru, the closer you'll get to enlightenment. Okay? But before that happens, you have to check out. And unfortunately, in this day and age, in the Kali Yuga, there's a lot of uh, misleading, you know, charlatans out there. Charlatan? No? Fakes. Huh? Fake, fake like a fake guru that's trying to take advantage of you. Right? We've, we've uh, read some stories like this in newspapers. Hmm? Yes. No. Too many. Okay? Okay? So, you understand? So before you just take someone on, uh, you check them out. Okay? And you make sure that, at the very least, they have your best interests in mind. Not themselves. Right? They don't want, uh, you know, fame, power, money. Uh, yeah. Get liberation and enlightenment. You know? 
That's that's the important thing. Okay. Mm. Okay. But anyway, once uh, we don't have time. But there's a there's a whole uh, series of, of teachings that, that identify the uh, characteristics or the, the qualities that you're trying to look for in a guru, but I just gave the essence there, right? It should, but in general, it should be learned. It should uh, have your interests in mind, have compassion, you know, have some experience in the path, you know, but also have a very firm basis of ethical discipline. Then, you know, they don't have to be famous, right? They don't have to be, you know, the recognized reincarnation of so-and-so. <coughs> they don't need to have fancy titles. They don't need to have, uh, you know, fancy websites, right? They don't need to be a celebrity. But the most important thing is actually that the teachings they give you, when you put it into practice, it benefits your mind. It means it makes your afflictive emotions decrease and your positive qualities increase. Okay? Yes? find someone like that, uh, things that you didn't think were possible become possible. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some what some of this stuff means, right? Essence, okay, such a guru like that, why are we calling her the essence encompassing all the Buddhas, right? So, <clears throat> such a qualified guru, right, the activities they're performing in this world is just like the Buddha would do if he were here. Yeah. He will teach you, or she will teach you, the very same um, teachings, that the Buddha would. And therefore is seen as like, you know, the originator of all the holy dharma of scripture and realization. So, I mean, one way to think about it is for you, you know. The originator means the source of all of the holy dharma of scripture and realization is your Buddha. Of course, we hold the, the historical Buddha up as someone to be revered and respected, but where is he now? We're not receiving direct teachings from the Buddha anymore, but your guru, your qualified guru, is. And so, in that sense, she is the originator of the Holy Dharma of Scripture and realization for you. Uh, principle of all Aryas and Ten Virtue, that means the, the Sangha, like, so of all the, the those in the uh, spiritual community, the spiritual community that um, you know supports you in your practice. The principle, the, the main one, actually is your guru. Your guru is the one who supports you the most. Okay. So then, I take refuge means you know, just like when it, it rains, you know, we try to find uh, some kind of shelter that can protect us. <clears throat> so those very things that we are trying to avoid in suffering samsara, we take refuge in our guru. It means by following the guru's advice, the guru's teachings, we're then able to protect ourselves from the suffering of samsara. Okay? Alright. So then please guru, bless my mind to become dharma, dharma to become the path and the path to be without obstacles. So, um, what does it mean for the mind 
Dhikam Dharma. So in the commentary by Lama Zobar Rishay on this, okay, uh, in this graduated path, right, the Lam Rim, where the, all the teachings of Buddha are arranged into order of practice, okay, then there was a great Indian master called uh, Atisha, who then arranged those kind of stages of practice into three types of beings, or uh, Purusha, being, okay? Purusha. A type of being means the motivation that <clears throat> they have primarily when they undertake their Dharma practice, okay? So, the first, as I said at the beginning, right, our normal inclination is to be just thinking of this life and the happiness of this life, okay? So, that one actually doesn't even qualify as a Dharma practitioner. You know, that's just a worldly being. So, as uh, Manjushri, our friend, the open Bible, uh, Buddha of Wisdom, he gave a teaching to a uh, great Tibetan uh, master, Dr. Gelsen, uh, and he said, if you're attached to this life, you're not a Dharma practitioner, okay? So the minimum bar for something to become Dharma is to prioritize future lives over this one, okay? So anyway, these three types of beings, then we talk about the, the small capability being, the medium capable being, and the great capable being. The small one, which is a Dharma practitioner, is fundamentally, con fundamentally concerned, primarily concerned with getting a good rebirth in the next life. Okay? Then they see that the uh, cause of being reborn in a low state, like an animal, is non-virtue, and the cause to be reborn in a good state is virtue, so then they abandon non-virtue as much as they can and accumulate as much virtuous activities as they can. Okay? That is a Dharma practitioner. Okay? It's great. Most of us don't even do that. Huh? It causes what? Dhammayana. Like how you have Mahayana, Hinayana, Tantrayana, and he calls it Dhammayana. He said even that's a, at least some motivation rather than, you know, not even thinking about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have not heard his own. I think the wisdom of compassion has this. I have not heard that, that uh, terminology, but um, regardless of what you, you call it, it's still a dominant motivation. It, it looks like you have a question dealing with what I've just talked about, right? Yes. Then you can ask. Yeah. So, the uh, method to transform suffering life into happiness. Mm. So, here it says, like, bless my mind to become a dharma. So, uh, dharma to become the path towards enlightenment. Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm in the middle of this. I'm just on the first one now. Yeah. Bless my mind to become Dharma. Okay, so I'm talking about this. Okay. So, okay, finish your question. So, with respect to his holiness, he told there are two types of Dharma. One is scriptural Dharma, mm. one is experiential Dharma. Mm. So, what is the difference between the two? Because the scriptural Dharma is like the Buddha and Allah, mm. and the experiential Dharma is like Yes, okay. So, that, that actually, if you look up, it's also in here. The originator of all the whole, of the, of the holy dharma of scripture and realization. Okay, so um, you see, but we call those dharma texts. That's not the real dharma. Okay, so the real the real dharma is the realizations in the mind of a dharma practitioner. Okay, now. If we want to be even more precise, okay, remember we were saying the root of samsara is the misapprehension of ourself, okay, 
So our main practice is to discover the reality of ourself. Okay? When we do that, we first do it through an inference, you know, a logical reasoning. But after we get a logical uh, reasoning, you know, that establishes it, okay, we then continue to meditate on that. And then, eventually, it will become a direct realization. Okay, so I'll give you an example, right? Uh, uh, the most famous inferential kind of cognizer, we call it, right, is when you see smoke on a faraway mountain, right, Based on that, you can infer there's a fire over there. You don't see the fire, right? Right? You can realize it. Why? Because you see smoke. Smoke is the effect of fire. In a place where there's uh, smoke, there necessarily has to have been a fire there that gave, gave rise to it, right? But you don't see the fire, but you realize it. You understand? That's, that's just an example of what we call inferential cognition, okay? So emptiness, we first, or selflessness, we first realize through inferential cognizer, okay? We don't see emptiness, but we realize it. Now, after we then meditate, at a certain point, it becomes a direct perceiver, and they call it actually the terminology yogic direct perceiver <coughs> or the direct perceiver of a yogi or yogi right they in meditation can see it you know and at that point it's like it appears you know to our own eyes like I can see you all directly right with my eyes it means not through some kind of inference or mental image but directly so at that point, when one has a direct realization of selflessness, by the way, it's a very advanced realization actually, but at that point, you start to abandon the misapprehension or the wrong view of the self. Okay? That direct realization is actually, you, you, you might have heard him talk about this, right? That's a realization. So you have the, the true path in the Four Noble Truths, true path and true cessation. You familiar with that? Okay, I believe you. I believe you, but some of us might not know what we're talking about. Simple. Like yeah. You're seeing each of us, we are just electrons and protons. We are just atoms. In reality. Well, so that's the part of that we realize. You see, I know you, I know you have this kind of thing with uh, you know physics and quantum mechanics and all that. But uh, but let, let me let me. I don't want to oversimplify, right? Even, even our, you know, our friend, Einstein, I think he said something like, you know, say things as simply as possible, but not more simply, right? So I, I don't want to say that we're just a collection of atoms and, and uh, you know, protons, electrons, all this, because the, the pillar would fit that description. And there's a very important difference between you and a pillar, right? You, know, you possess a mind. You're a sentient being. So, if I, if, I, if I then just reduce you to, oh, you're just protons and atoms and all this, then I'm losing out on something very fundamental, a fundamental difference that's important. That pillar is never going to become enlightened. Sorry. No, but it doesn't care. It's not sentient. It's not even offended by that. You know? Protons and neutrons are uh, okay. names, names, but with our brain also have uh, neurons. Neurons, we say. Okay. Now. What was I saying? Okay, okay. So the realization. 
Well, yeah, so, so you're not just protons and, and neurons, and you know, whatever, okay? So don't, uh, what I'm saying to answer your question, when we say dharma of realization, that means either a direct realization of the fundamental nature of reality, or when we realize it directly, we start to abandon the imprints, sorry, the seeds of that wrong view in our mental continuum. One day, okay, so, so, <clears throat> okay. we have a, the wrong view of ourselves, the story view of reality, okay. Now, right now, or, or let, let, let's even make it more simple, we have anger, but right now, we don't have anger, right? Okay. But we would have what we <coughs> what they call seed. Seed of anger means the ability or the potential for anger to arise again in our mental continuum. Okay? Alright. And as long as we have those seeds, when we meet with certain causes and conditions the anger will arise again. Okay? Now, at a certain point, we're going to not only not just not have anger, but abandon the seeds of anger so that it becomes impossible for anger to arise again in our mental continuum. Okay? And that actually is what the attainment of nirvana is. Yes. Means all these afflictive emotions are not just anger, jealousy, pride, attachment, greed, jealousy, whatever. Not only do they not exist, but their seeds are abandoned. The potential for them to arise again are abandoned. Okay? So, how do we do that? By directly realizing selflessness. When we directly realize selflessness, then each time we do, we, well, not each time, but we start to abandon the seeds. And then, when we abandon them completely, hmm, nirvana just is that state of abandonment of the afflictive emotions and their seeds. That's what nirvana is. So when you say, what's the, what's the, the, the dharma of realization? <clears throat> it's those two things. The direct realization of selflessness and this abandonment. This mm, is a type of real, something we realize, something we actualize. You know? It's a bit funny to say, right? But we... Yeah, this impossibility that we achieve for certain afflictions to arise again. That is a type of realization. Okay? And that is the Dharma of realization. Those two things. But the experiential realization is subjective, right? See, my experience is different and his experience yes. is different. So uh -huh. how Dharma is universally uh, valid. Uh -huh. What I'm saying, suppose Dharma can be realized only through experience. Yes. But every experience is different. Yes. It's a subjective. Yes, but, you see, <clears throat> while that is true, you see, um, if you, if I, if anyone tries to really pinpoint that self, right, there's going to be, uh, okay, There are certain thoughts that are in accord with reality and others that are not in accord with reality. Okay. Like, if there, you know, someone thought there's a two-ton pink elephant in my hand, okay, that 
is a possible possibility for a thought. Someone could believe that. But that type of thought is not in accord with reality. Okay. It's not in accord with conventional reality, but anyway, it's not in accord with reality. So there would be a way to then, you know, through analysis, check, right? <laughs> Whatever you want to do to test. And then the previously, you know, the previous conception of a two tongue pink elephant in my hand would then be eliminated. Right? Okay. So now, the mind that we have that conceives the I, okay, let's just, let's just take on board Buddha's hypothesis for the time being. That the type of, of I that we conceive of actually doesn't exist in reality. Okay? But people who are untrained in philosophy, ordinary beings like ourselves, we hold on to something. We believe in something that doesn't exist. At a certain end of deep analysis, there'll be a discovery that that one doesn't exist. And the one that doesn't exist actually has never existed. Okay? It's actually a, a, a fantasized, projected, you know, impossible way of existing that never has existed. Sorry, this is... You know, I, I told you all at the beginning. Wow, these newcomers are so good, you know, we're just going to make it really easy for you. But do you understand? This impossible fantasized mode of existing, does it exist? No. But we have a mind that holds on to it as if it is true, as if it exists. So our job is to analyze whether that one that that mind holds on to exists or not. Then through logic, through reasoning, through analysis, we come to see that it doesn't exist. And although all of our experiences are individually unique, you see, since that mode of existing is impossible, anyone through the right mode of reasoning and analysis will come to the same conclusion. Just like if we all know what it means for there to be a, a, a two-ton pink elephant, in my hand, we'll all come to the same conclusion that there's no two-ton pink elephant in my hand. Right? Although, and that still would preserve the individuality of experience. You see? So, please just take that as a hypothesis, but I'm trying to give it how those two things can coincide. Yes? Alright. I answered your question, I answered your question. All right, so, bless my mind to become Dharma. Okay, so what I was saying is, Lama Zoparimeshe, in his commentary on this text, he likens these three lines of this stanza to the three types of beings. And that's what I was explaining. The first line, he connects to the small capable being, whose primary motivation is to get a good rebirth in the next life. Yes. Okay? Now, to dharma, for dharma to become the path. Okay? So here, remember? Uh, no, no, it's not even remember, because it's new. The Four Noble Truths. We have the truth of suffering, truth of the cause of suffering, truth of the cessation of suffering, truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, Dilshad, you've heard that before, right? Those four? Okay. Truth of the suffering, okay, we all know. Cause of suffering is karma and afflictions. Afflictions, the primary one being the misapprehension of the self. But, since the misapprehension of the self is a misapprehension, not in accord with reality, there's a way to abandon that completely. And that's the third noble truth. The Four Noble Truths is the first uh, teaching of Buddha. That third one, cessation of suffering, means 
those misconceptions uh, totally abandoned with their seeds. Okay? Yes? Is this apprehension itself is not a reality? Yes. But yet it, but yet it, believe, it believes. Just like if someone... Okay, so these are two important things, right? If someone believed there's a two-tongued pink elephant in my hand, okay, that mind could exist. The misapprehension exists, but what that misapprehension conceives of doesn't exist. You understand? There's no two-ton pink elephant in my hand. It's gray. I'm joking. Jo joking, I'm joking. There's no two-ton two gray elephant in my hand. I, you see? Sorry, I'm trying to be funny. Doesn't always work. Okay. But you understand? So the mind that misconceives reality exists. The object held on to that by that misconception doesn't exist. Okay. The mind conceiving of a pink elephant, two-ton pink elephant in my hand can exist. The two-ton pink elephant in my hand doesn't exist. So there's a mind, it, can, it grasps onto something, it believes in something. So we have those two. But why does the mind even, if this doesn't exist, why does the mind even have the notion of existing then? I mean, you're imagining that. Here, here, here's, here's the problem. <clears throat> okay, let, let's forget about pink elephants. A mirage. Okay? A mirage. In the hot desert? Yes? there's an appearance of water from the side of the hot sand. Yes? Yes? You understand? Mirage? Yeah? Mm, mirage. Yeah, mirage. Yeah. Okay? So someone can believe there's water there, right? You're far away, you're far away. You say, oh, there's water. I'm so thirsty. I'm gonna go there, right? Right? You get there, you discover no water is there, okay? So the mind holding on to water over there from the side of the mirage is a wrong view. But it arose because there's an appearance of water from the side of the hot sand. Okay? Now. So my God deceived there. Yeah. Yes. Now here's the problem. There's an appearance for all of us right now. There's a false appearance. Actually, according to, you know, Buddha, of course, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, unless we're Buddhas, then every one of our eye consciousness is a mistaken consciousness. So we have a false appearance. The appearance doesn't accord with reality. We have a false appearance and we grasp onto it as being real. You know? Just like the person that sees the water from the side of the mirage, if they grasp just the appearance, no problem. But Mirad exists. Well, yes, but it's not water. No, that's okay, but Mirad yeah. exists. Yes. Who? Mirad exists. Yes. But the way, the way it appears to us is deceptive, illusory. No, no, no. If, it, if we have an appearance of water, okay, there's no water there. So in that sense, it's, it's like an illusion, right? See, there's no water. We know that there's no water, but mirage is there. Yes, 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 yes. But, but hold on. We, if we're far away, we can believe there's water there. But when we know that there is a, it's a mirage, then how is it that we we'll conceive it as water? If we know. If we know, then we don't get into trouble. So even 
you know, after, so, so even we, after we realize emptiness, this is actually what they call it. We have the space-like meditative equipoise, where when we're in meditative equipoise, meditative, we recognize the reality and it's like space. Because then, Mirak is also a reality. Okay, just, 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 just uh, I sometimes say this, and I'm going to say it again, okay? Uh, when, we, when we come to these classes, okay, we either have to be super, super smart, or just completely dumb. Okay, and here's what I'm saying. When I give examples, of course, they're examples and they don't do everything. But an example can illustrate one purpose, you know, very well. Okay? So this example of the mirage, it's showing that, a couple things. We can have an appearance of something that isn't in accord with reality. And so what is in accord with reality? There's an appearance of water from the side of hot sand, and there's no water there. Okay? I was answering your question, why then? Wow! You know? So I was saying, the Buddha is saying, we have an appearance of a false eye. Okay? Just the appearance of a false eye, not so much of a problem. If, if, like the person who then, okay, first we're fooled. I think there's water there, I'm thirsty. We go there, what? Come on, it's a mirage. You know? Then we know. Then we walk back to where we were and we turn around, we see the appearance of water. We say, no, 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 no. Even your buddy says, oh, I'm thirsty, I'm going to go. No, no, I went there. I know the truth. There's no water there. Sorry. Okay? So just the mere appearance doesn't necessarily have to get us into trouble. But before we realize the reality, it can. If we believe that false appearance is true. Okay? So you're saying, how then do we have, if this false sense of, of I, if that one doesn't exist, why do we believe in it? You know? And, and my answer was, because there's an appearance of it. And we, we, we believe in the appearance as be, being the reality. And that, by the way, Aryadeva says, <clears throat> he said in his 400, 400 stanzas, those of little merit do not even doubt this doctrine. But merely entertaining a doubt about emptiness tears the foundations of samsara to shreds. You understand? So those of little merit, those with, with, without much positive karma, you know, they don't even doubt this doctrine means the doctrine of emptiness means believing all the appearances, that's how it is. Oh yes, everything is apparent, that's the reality for me. And they don't even question, you know? Does that make sense? Is there, I mean, before you came here, or you know, before you started coming to the center, do you even talk about it this way? Is there objective reality, you know? You realize emptiness with your mind. And you could say it's a tool, yeah. But, okay. Uh, I really thought I was gonna get this whole, this whole book and then this, this supplementary paper. I thought, yeah, two hours, Shanti. Just leave it to the old Namjo. 
But the objective is to complete those papers. I mean, we are we are getting lot of information. Good. It's good. That's good. what I think about. I mean, this is nothing. This is nothing. We are getting lot of information by discussions. <laughs> Give him a VIP membership. I want you to come to all my classes. Because there's people in the back. I want him to go to the water. That's how I think. That's how I think. Otherwise, you know, we can just read through it. You know, come on. Okay. I like this one. No, I'm joking. See, that is the thing, right? Okay. Enough uh, fun and games. Okay, so remember three purusha, three types of being, right? Mind to become dharma. Dharma to become the path. So in general, then dharma we have the four noble truths, truth of cessation, then truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Truth of cessation means when we have abandoned the afflictions. Okay? Truth of the path leading to the cessation is then what? The real path is the direct realization of emptiness. Because as I was saying, when we get direct realization of emptiness, then we'll start to abandon the seeds of the afflictions. Okay? So then, see, bless my mind to become dharma means we're saying small capable being, the initial capable being prioritizing future life more than this life. But dharma to become the path, okay, that means become the path means to get direct realization of selflessness. Now, the path to be without obstacles, see, to gloss it over in the, the great capable being, right, they are wanting to get not just mere nirvana for themselves alone, but full enlightenment for the benefit of all sending beings. So now, obstacles. Obstacles to attaining complete enlightenment. Now, actually, I'm now seeing two, that little footnote. Let's look at two. Huh. Wow. You see at the very back and there's notes. Notes. The second to the last picture. So this is what I was saying. Um Lamza Murmche explains these three lines contain the eighty-four thousand teachings taught by Buddha, which include the Hinayana teachings, the Mayana teachings of Param, uh, Paramitayana and Vajrayana, all those teachings are combined into the Lamin, the graduate path of life, which is divided into the graduate path of Goa, the middle and high and beings. These three contain the whole Lamin and is contained in three principal aspects of the path to Lamin. Okay. So that's basically what I said. But how then? Huh? Yeah. And the path to be without obstacles. So actually, for a Dharma practitioner, they talk about, you know, different types of obstacles. Outer obstacles, inner obstacles, secret obstacles, blah, 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 right? But here, what we need to mostly concern ourselves with is who is the one that's free of obstacles? The Buddha. What is the, the, the main obstacles we're trying to achieve? Right, I'm sorry. Obstacles is an obstacle from us achieving something, right? Mm -hmm. So here, we have obstacles that, that prevent us from achieving liberation and obstacles that protect, prevent us from achieving full enlightenment, Buddhahood. So it's only the Buddhas who have no obstacles. So here to say, Guru, bless my mind, to become Dharma, may I prioritize my future lives more in this life. Dharma here in this sense loosely is my practice. May my practice then become the path that realizes selflessness. And this realization of selflessness to be completely free of all obstacles that 
would prevent me from becoming liberated or enlightened. I want full enlightenment. Until, okay, so now I'm on page 8. Until I achieve Buddhahood, please bless me to be like youthful Nor Song and Bodhisattva always crying, incorrectly following the virtuous friend with pure thought and action, seeing whatever is done in pure, uh, as pure, and accomplishing whatever is said and advised. Okay? So I've talked about this a little bit already. Um, Huh? What? Can we have two different uh, versions? You look at this. There are two different versions. Why are there two different versions? Huh? Boss. But but are they are they the, the same words? Is it, it, it is this the old one or the new one? Which one? The one I gave you is the new one. So the new one is pink. Pink is the old one. And they, you gave them the old one. Yeah, I saw, because it was distributed while I was printing out, so they bought the old one. If you want a new one, I can give you a new one to take home. You see, all of the suffering in samsara is based in ignorance. <laughs> you see? Yeah, if you're taking them home, there are new ones here, you can take them. I'm glad this happened. This, this proves my point. But actually, for, for these, I think there's not, there's not any difference. So now page 8, page 6, whatever you have, okay? This is how to uh, correctly follow the rituals from the root of the path to full enlightenment. Um, we already talked about this. So youthful Norse song and Bodhisattva always crying are two... Um, uh, bodhisattvas. Bodhisattva is someone who's not yet enlightened, but have the wish to become enlightened. So in their biographies, you see the way that they follow their, their gurus. It was like unbelievably perfect. Okay? And therefore they made tremendous progress along the path to enlightenment in a short amount of time. Okay? Um... What should we do, Shanti? It's uh, 7.55. We have until 8. What should we do? We continue until 8. Bless me to see this greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses is difficult to find and easily perishes. The action and the result are so profound that the sufferings of the evil god and child migratory beings are so difficult to bear. Therefore, please bless me to take refuge from the depths of my heart and the three ways of blind ones to abandon negative karma and to accomplish virtue according to Dharma. Okay. This is the graduated path of the lower capable being. Okay? So we've already talking about those in, in brief, and this is in more detail. Remember, low capable of being, primarily interested in getting good rebirth in the next life. So, how then 
does one transform the motivation from primarily chasing after the happiness and comfort of this life to then caring about our future life? Just like this. Seeing that this greatly meaningful body of freedoms and richnesses is difficult to find easily perishes. So, body, okay. What it really means is this type of rebirth. This type of psychophysical continuum that we have, yes, is endowed with these, what they call in the traditional text, freedom and richnesses. Freedom and richnesses, there are 18 characteristics of a type of precious human rebirth, they call, that give us the tremendous opportunity to make progress along the path to enlightenment. But basically, it's, it's being smart enough, uh, with enough kind of interest in the Dharma, with access to the Dharma teachings, Basically, to boil it down, it's like that, you know? If we didn't have interest in the teachings, if the teaching didn't exist, if we, you know, didn't speak a language that they existed in, um, yeah, if we weren't uh, kind of smart enough, we couldn't, couldn't make much uh, progress, yeah? So, this greatly meaningful is greatly meaningful because we can attain enlightenment in this lifetime. Well, of course, if we don't do that, we can attain liberation from samsara in this life. If we can't do that, well, we can at least assure ourselves a good rebirth in the next lifetime. Or, rebirth in a, you know, a pure land of, of the Buddha. Okay? So, it's greatly meaningful. It's very difficult to find, means, well, it's very rare. So, I often make this comment, but uh, just because someone has a human birth doesn't mean they have a precious human rebirth as is talked about here. Of course, all life is precious. But I mean, how many people in this world, you know, have interest in coming to transform their minds on a Friday night rather than going out to whatever people go out to these days, right? Hmm? So, I don't know, we have 12 huh? people? Yes? Bangalore might have 12 million, yes? So you guys are all one in a million. Okay? Then you look in the whole world. You know, very rare. Right? Then you look, you add the animals. There's more ants in Dommler than there are humans in the world. Yeah? And then you consider the time element. The Buddha appeared 2,500 years ago. Before that, the Buddha's teachings are eventually going to perish in this world, despite our best efforts. And then, you know, then they have times when, you know, the, the path to, to liberation is uh, completely obscured. So, anyway, very difficult to find. Easily perishes means we can die any time. Action and result are so profound. So here then, become, it's not just that, you see, we die and that's it, but the mental continuum goes on. Action and result are so profound means that from negative actions come rebirth in lower realms, you know, and the sufferings of the evil gone transmigratory beings are so Horrible, difficult to bear. Right? So then, what do we do in that situation? Take refuge from the deaths of our heart and the three of our survival ones. That means the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Now, just like 
if we're outside and it starts raining, just to say, okay, roof, you know, we're in the middle of the street, roof, please protect me. It doesn't work. But it's actually do something and go inside, right? So although the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, you know, we have to follow the advice, you see, from the depths of our heart, turn our mind towards Dharma means to incorporate the teachings in our lives. And what does that mean? Abandon negative karma and accomplish virtue in accordance with the Buddhist teachings. So that is the practice of lower capable of being. If we do that, we are our practitioners. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. I have other questions. Yes? See, the Dharma says, unless you leave attachment and desire, you can't transform your suffering life, life into happiness. Uh, but the idea of suffering life into happiness itself is a desire. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good question. Yeah. So, uh, see, here we have to distinguish between the desire that binds us to samsara, because all not, well, not all desires are created equal. Okay. So the desire we have for like the happiness of this life, you know, um, it's like contaminated desire. But the desire for you know sending beings to be free from suffering, the desire to attain uh, good rebirth, the desire to attain enlightenment, those are desires, or we can say aspirations, that we need to cultivate. On the path. Um, and yeah. See, I'll just preview the next paragraph, right? Independence upon that, even if I achieve the mere higher rebirth of the devil or human, I'll still have to experience suffering endlessly in samsara. So the mere desire to get a good rebirth in our next life is still a desire that eventually needs to be transcended because that's still a rebirth within samsara you know but for the time being um, that is a as, as far as desires go it's at least a virtuous one I don't think so Now, there's good news. There's bad news, of course. We're in samsara. So the bad news is that time is up for the night. Well, maybe some of you are like looking at what you like. That's not bad news. But the good news is that um, Since this, this text is very um, emphasized by our spiritual you know, guru, Lama Zoparishe, you know, he's given commentary on this. And that commentary is available for all of you. If you want. Um, it can be you know, made available to you very easily. Yeah. Um, it can be downloaded from the FPMT website. <clears throat> if you just look up this, <clears throat> you'll find there's a commentary on it. Actually, I could even just. Uh, Shani, can we? Is it too much work for you to go online, Google something, and then download it? You see, we have one, sorry. Is opening up Google is so hard. It's available as a PDF. I have it right here. I can airdrop it to you. Thank you. Or you can just go on the website. You know, it's it's like, better to go on the website and then see if the and all that. Yeah. And come on. 
we can't spoon feed you everything. It's like I tell you the, the link. Oh no 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 no. I'm hungry. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, so after doing meditation, we have to practice uh, this. Uh, we have to read out all this, and each and every time when we read out, so what is the mo how to realize it? What what we need to understand? So that's my question. So how it is going to beneficial if you? Yeah, 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 that's a very good question. Unfortunately. We only have like one real paragraph of the body. But what you do is very slowly, you see. Means as you go through it, please bless me to see that this greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses. Okay. So you kind of pause. And just like I was explaining, right? really meaningful. You then, you see, as I was saying, the whole path to enlightenment is here in two pages, right? So that means every phrase, actually, we need to unpack. So what is greatly meaningful? And then just pause and reflect. Why is it greatly meaningful? Do you remember what I said? It's greatly meaningful for three reasons. Because we're going to with this body, we can achieve full enlightenment. If we don't do that, we can at least achieve liberation from samsara. If we don't do that, we can at least achieve a precious human rebirth. You know? So compared to you know the worldly pursuits we get, that we normally get caught up in, trying to find a high-paying day job, right? Compared to you know, spend all our energy doing that. We come late to our Dharma class because we have an interview. <laughs> then, to get any one of those, those higher purposes is greatly meaningful. Okay? So, greatly meaningful body with freedoms and richnesses. Then, freedoms. And I mentioned there's 18. So that when, what we can do is then go through those. You know? If we have more time, unpack and go through each kind of, you know, day by day. So, just to give you an example, the eight freedoms is four non-human states and four human states. One of the non-human states is being born as an animal. So you can think, oh wow, if I were born as an animal, if I had been reborn as an animal, how difficult would it be to practice meditation? I wouldn't even think of it. Now that I've been born as a human, I can practice Dharma so precious, so amazing, you know? And have joy well up in your heart, overflowing. So when you do quite slow like this and unpack, you know, then how does it benefit the mind? If you really took all this to heart, uh, probably your whole life would be transformed. Means what you spend your time on, you know, um, you wouldn't even harm a mosquito. And you'd be just engaging in virtue day and night. So that's that's the point of this. How this mantra will be helpful? Hmm? Which mantra? So at the end of this. Yeah. So he's talking about the end. I didn't get there. <laughs> so don't. Those mantras they come later for a reason. However. If you do go on that website, if you just look this up, you know, Method to Transform Suffering Life into Happiness, you'll find this file. You'll also find the commentary. 
Can you see this? You see, the, the title page is the same except a commentary. Then, even more good news. This is actually part of a uh, online class that you can join for free. And it will have Rums over Rinpoche himself talking about it. Now, maybe some of you, if you have trouble with my accent, then some people, it's even more difficult, they find, to understand Ramzopo's speech. But his speech is then uh, transcribed, so you can also read. Okay? So that's the good news, huh? What is, what is the meaning of false eye? <laughs> it's a great question, however, we're out of time. But, but, but false eye means the eye doesn't exist. No, no, the, there is a, there's a, there's an eye that exists, and then there's a false eye. The false eye doesn't exist. It's like, you know, you have, um, uh, counterfeit money. You understand? Bitcoin. Oh, no, Bitcoin? No. Counterfeit money means a note, so let's not get too, too cute. You have a note, and you, you check. You look at the, at all the security features. Thank you, Modi. Right? Then you have some, it's just paper. It's not worth anything. That's a, like a false note. How much can dollar and also have an eye on it? Because we are seeing with eye, how do we generate yes. eye on Okay, 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 okay. So before we take off, let's dedicate the merit. Okay, anyway, the false eye means doesn't exist. Let's dedicate the merit. So, due to the positive energy we've created in our time t today, may all sentient beings, vast as the vast in the space, be free of all suffering and attain the state of enlightenment quickly, without even a second's delay. Okay? We're over time, so just some advertising. We now have a session tomorrow night, 6 to 8.